Noting the hour and the presence of a quorum, I call the Acton Boxborough Regional School Committee to order. Members of the public who wish to watch the meeting online may use Acton TV's YouTube channel found at the top of the agenda. This meeting is also being recorded and will be posted on Acton TV's website at actontv.org. Welcome to our newest school committee members from Acton, Tori Campbell, Leela Ramachandran, yes, okay, and Yanshin Schmidt. Yes, we are excited to have you here at the committee um, and to begin your tenure. Uh, Boxborough's election is May 16th, so the committee will welcome two new Boxborough members at the next meeting due to my retirement and Evelyn Abaya Issa's retirement. Um, I wanted to use my chairperson's welcome tonight to actually do some business that kind of got left off at the end of the meeting last time because our meeting went very, very late um, until almost 10.30 last time. And we didn't have a uh, proper time, I don't think, to thank the retiring members. So the three active members who are not here tonight, Amy Krishna Murthy, Kira Cook, and Yebin Wang, um, we didn't really take the time, that's something that we generally do as a committee, is take the time to thank and recognize the time that those people have given to the committee. Um, Kira served one term on the school committee. Um, she was the chair this year. She served on the budget subcommittee um, and gave of lots and lots of time to, um, to, to the committee. Um, and she actually is, is moving on and um, it was wonderful that she gave her time as the first African American chair as a, of our committee, which was also important. Um, Yebin also served one, one term. He um, was on the policy subcommittee, I believe for two years um, and gave his perspective as a member of the school committee and it was, um, it was a valuable, uh, a valuable perspective that I think brought a lot of information to the, to members of the town who are not also part of the edu educational community. And Amy served three terms on the school committee. Um, she was a member or chaired, actually member and chaired, of almost every subcommittee that the school committee has. So she was a member of the budget subcommittee, she chaired the budget subcommittee, she was a member of the policy subcommittee, she's chaired the policy subcommittee, she served on negotiations three times, she was the vice chair of the school committee twice, she was the chair of the school committee, and all of that happened during a tumultuous time, um, and she gave almost half of her children's lives to the the career that she served on the school committee. So we thank her very much for her time and just wanted to take a few minutes to, to recognize those 12 years between the, no, 15 years between the three of them that they, that they gave to the community. So um, tonight we also have um, a, some of our student representatives here. Molly's here, uh, Diksha is here, and Julia is here. Would any of you like to come up? There we go. Oh, I actually figured it out this time. It's amazing. Um, so the last time we were here was two weeks ago or three weeks ago or whatever. So not much has happened in that time because one of the weeks was break. So, you know, obviously nothing happened then. And then the last two weeks have been pretty chaotic at school, not because anything has happened, but because it's been like AP tests, which I don't take any EP classes, but I've been feeling the stress of the fact that teachers are just pushing a lot of assessments in, which is not their fault, It's that's what happens at this time of year. This time of year is just always very busy at school because it's nearing the end of the year and everybody wants to get everything in before the end of the year. So I've definitely been feeling the stress. I know my friends have been feeling the stress, but other than that, not much has happened. So they have stuff to talk about too. <laughs> Okay, hi, um, I'm Julia. I'm a freshman class leader and school committee representative. So um, like Molly said, there hasn't been too much activity at the high school recently because of break. And then everyone's been busy with AP, um, AP tests. But the freshman class leaders have been organizing the book fair, as I mentioned last meeting um, in April. 
And so far we've had four days and our final day is tomorrow. It's been successful. And um, we've managed to overcome some um, earlier technical difficulties with the credit card machines, um, as well as some other things. So that's been nice. And we hope that um, this can serve as an example for like future community events, um, since we're doing with the Silver Unicorn Bookstore. And um, I know that a lot of the community at the high school, both students and teachers, have been really involved with helping us advertise and um, sell our books. And yeah, I hope that this can be an example for the future, and I look forward to continuing doing this work. Thank you. Hello, I am Diksha, and I'm a freshman. And I am also a member of ABSEJ, the AP Students for Equity and Justice. Currently, we are working on a proposal for um, gender-neutral bathrooms. And we have met with Ms. Faber and Ms. Dean about this. Um, currently, an issue is that um, we do have gender-neutral bathrooms at the school, yet they are placed in inconvenient locations. And um, there isn't proper signage as well, so students and staff aren't completely aware of the fact that there are gender-neutral bathrooms. And to counter this issue, um, our proposal has stated um, um, improving signage and also moving a bathroom to a central location so that it can be convenient for students during class to access these facilities. And so um, we've talked to staff and admin about this, and this is just a process. Um, nothing has happened yet. Uh, Ms. Faber and Ms. Dean are working out the logistics, but I hope it works out well. So, yep, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming and reporting tonight. Per school committee policy BEDH, members of the public are invited to speak for up to three minutes regarding items that are not on the agenda. For items on the agenda, the public is asked to please wait for that item. Speakers must be recognized by the chair before speaking. The committee does not typically respond to comments during public participation. Is there anyone who would like to speak tonight? Hello, thank you. Uh, Scott Smyers, Central Street. I'm glad to see some new faces in the school committee. It's gonna be good. I hope we have a fresh start. I've come to a lot of meetings. I've been quite critical of many of your decisions and ideas over the past. And I hope that um, going forward <clears throat> with the new faces on the committee, the new el the election we just had, you'll be open to parents, not ignoring them, please. Uh, maybe if you can't answer their questions, uh, you can uh, think about it long and hard and try to be able to answer them next time because some of these ideas that are being proposed are just not adding up to scrutiny. You've had, <clears throat> I want to thank the members that are <clears throat> retiring, but not like most people who are thanking, thanking them. I'm thanking you for please not doing any more damage to our community. Except for Yebin, I will give an example of where I saw Yebin provide some incredibly valuable advice and it was completely ignored by the rest of the members of the school committee. After you decided that we were gonna get a new mascot name and decided on the term revolution, which I still don't see anyone excited about, Yebin pointed out that revolution is not always a positive thing. It can be very negative. Millions of people die in revolutions. He had some first-hand experience in that, and there was no discussion about it, you know? So you have to look at those diversity of opinions and not just focus on the same dogma that we've been hearing over and over again, like the students are either from a victim class or an oppressor class. Uh, we have a climate emergency, and if we don't do something to change our whole economic system immediately, we're all gonna die or burn to a crisp. This is making children very anxious, stressed out, and it's unnecessary and uh, unresponsible of a school committee to stand by and let that happen. So please, listen to the parents. Don't talk to them like the chair from the last, the, the, the chair that's not here today has been doing, especially at that last meeting, talking down to parents as if they were badly behaved farm animals. You know, that's not a way to treat our citizens. 
please be open, transparent, seconds. and uh, respectful to the parents and the students. I always, my favorite part of the school committee meeting is when the students give their updates. That's always very refreshing and realistic. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, good evening, Martin Benson, 21 Deacon Hunt Drive. First, the behavior of the previous chair at the last school committee meeting was out of order and not compatible with a democratic approach to local government. During the public comment period following the ongoing discussion regarding academic leveling, the chair interrupted and threatened a speaker and anyone else who opposed these reforms. This past year, the former chair implemented and enforced a rule that all comments during public comment sessions must be, quote, civil, end quote. This rule provided her the ability to interrupt and silence anyone expressing an opposing viewpoint. This past March, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts ruled in Barron v. Calenda that, quote, under both Articles 19 and 16, such civility restraints on the content of speech at a public comment session in a public meeting are forbidden, end quote. Thus, the chair's practice was illegal. As the attorney who represented the plaintiffs in the Barron case sits on the ver this very board, there is simply no excuse for this board to continue violating the free speech rights of the public. Secondly, that during the school committee's October 15, 2020 meeting, this board voted to illegally retire the colonial mascot in direct violation of the district's naming policy. Throughout the meeting, the current acting chair was seen engaging in text message communications with two other committee members while she was chairing the meeting. This was later confirmed in writing by the school district's attorney. Thus, these text messages are considered public records. On November 5th, 2020, I submitted a records request to the district seeking these text messages. For over two years, the school district and its law firm fought the release of these public records. Despite engaging in dilatory tactics, the school district's attorney stated assuringly in a letter, quote, school committee members have been advised to preserve their personal records in light of an instant appeal, end quote. However, when the school district could no longer defend the withholding of these public records, the district acknowledged to the Secretary of State that members were no longer in possession of these text messages. This despite assurances that school committee members would maintain these records in accordance with the law. The school district included a written admission from Ms. McKinley that she had recently deleted the records, which is a crime under Massachusetts general law. These deleted text messages are likely still recoverable, though it will require extensive legal proceedings which the school district will likely obstruct. It's not right that this board continues to cut programs, staff, and services while concurrently providing unlimited funding for legal services intended to impede the adherence to the public records law. In the fall of 2020, this board voted to authorize unlimited spending on legal services in response to records request and open meeting law complaints. During the discussion, Superintendent Light estimated the price would be around $1,000. The total cost the district has spent on legal fees far exceeds the quoted price. Further, the district has provided incomplete responses to inquiries regarding this matter. Hopefully, this, the newly elected members from Acton and those to be elected from Boxborough will provide a much needed change of direction from what we have seen over the past two years. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Evelyn, I forgot to say thank you to you. And the reason was because I was so caught up in nobody and in, in the lack of acknowledgement about the active members who retired at the last meeting and you weren't here, I'd like to acknowledge your service on the school committee, and I apologize. Evelyn has served one term. We ran together three years ago, and um, you have been a remarkable member from Boxborough, and I thank you for your service. You served on the policy subcommittee, yes? Yeah? For three years. And thank you to you for getting me into this. <laughs> Peter, I'll throw it to you. All right, so a few updates for you. Um, first, April 28th uh, was our 29th, no, no intention there, I guess, um, annual community service day. Over 400 seniors participated in 47 service projects throughout the community. Um, Acton Boxborough students worked in teams on projects such as raking, mulching, cleaning, painting, and much more. 
Um, AB, this, for us, this is a rich tradition that goes back, obviously, 29 years um, in the making. So I just want to say we're very proud of all of our seniors and just to express appreciation for all of their sponsors, faculty, staff um, who helped make that happen, and the community members who were able to get engaged with it. So thank you, seniors. Um, I also want to congratulate our Special Olympians um, who participated in our Special Olympics um, at Leary Field on Wednesday, April 26th. Um, that was a fantastic event. I had an opportunity to get up there and see a little bit of it. Um, just really well done. Um, we also recently hosted our first ever unified track meet, so that's also very exciting to be able to have in the district. Um, and you know, just want to thank all of the students who are participating, all of the families um, who support the kids, but also our staff uh, for working to get these programs up and running. So thank you very much. This is kind of the traditional month of celebration in schools. Um, I think every day we're celebrating something different. Um, but thank you to all of our principals, certainly, for all of the work that they do. Um, Nurses Week is May 6th through 12th. Uh, we know that they've done a lot of work over the last several years um, to make sure everyone is healthy and safe. And May 8th through the 12th is Teacher Appreciation Week that we have coming up. So thank you to all of our staff. Um, project graduation, I just want to put another plug in for that organization. Um, if you have been following the last few meetings, you'll know we're continuing to make announcements and try and send out information about project graduation. It's an incredibly important community event that is hosted for our graduating students. Um, they are struggling with volunteers and they have been struggling more and more each year over the last several years. So particularly parents of younger kids who will be with the system for a few years, we'd love to encourage you to get involved. So we'll send out another sign-up link to all of our families tomorrow with the update. The next Cartwheel Care webinar um, is coming up, and that is on recognizing and managing anxiety. So that one is going to be held uh, Wednesday, May 31st at 7 p.m., and we'll send out all of the registration information uh, to families about that. I also want to plug, put a plug in um, for Open Door Theater um, and Danny's Place Youth Services. They are having an Ask Me Fair, um, which is a special event to meet and talk uh, with some awesome grown-ups. Uh, the event is free, but registration for the event is required. Uh, this is an opportunity where children are invited to ask questions, listen to, and converse with presenters from a wide range of backgrounds and who are happy to share their stories and experiences. So they're inviting everyone to come with an open heart um, and an open mind to listen and learn um, and hopefully go home with a better understanding of the world that we all live in. So we'll send out some information to our families about that. We also have an upcoming, and our last community coffee um, is going to be May 24th. That is going to be virtual. It was originally scheduled in the evening. We have a conflict now that night, so we're going to move it to the morning. Uh, but that is a virtual event um, for families. That will be the last one of the year. Um, and then we also have our Safer Homes, Safer Community um, event. When we put the flyer in, that is the gun buyback program that we run with the police. Um, so we'll send that out as well. Um, also want to just give you a heads up at the next meeting. Uh, we're going to be giving you a more in-depth um, update on the Welcome Center and the work that we've been doing around that. We're actually progressing very well. Um, number of updates that I want to share with you. Um, one, we are beginning some of the, you know, facelift in the area that we've designated to be the Welcome Center. We actually use the funds um, from if you rem have been following school committee for a couple of years, we were members of a collaborative EDCO that has dissolved. Um, once that dissolved and the final accounting was done, we actually got money back from that. So we were able to allocate that money directly to uh, looking at the Welcome Center and making that a better place for families to come and register, but also to come and receive ongoing services and supports um, throughout their time at AB. Um, that's underway, but even more exciting, um, we are at a stage now where I can publicly announce we've actually been in pretty deep discussions with Acton Boxborough United Way to actually do a district United Way partnership um, to bring the Welcome Center to fruition. The United Way has a long um, and rich tradition of, you know, providing services and, you know, kind of connecting families and people in need in our communities with different services. And so we're kind of at the final stage now uh, where we're looking at an agreement um, that would actually take United Way and house it in 
the district administration building with us um, and they would actually provide the staffing and volunteer support for the welcome center um, so it's a really nice mutual beneficial uh, arrangement so we're going to be giving you an update on that at the next meeting um, and we'll have some people from United Way here to speak but we'll also have um, Jen Faber and Mary Ann Young who have been really spearheading that initiative be able to speak to that so very exciting stuff it's coming to fruition uh, we're anticipating that opening this summer um, I did talk to Senator Eldridge uh, because I had connected with him early in the you know state budget process and requested that this would be a good opportunity for an earmark um, for the district we had noted that you know Acton and Boxborough have not really received many very many earmarks over the last few years at the state level um, so I'd spoke with him yesterday um, and he indicated that that earmark is still sitting in the state budget on the Senate side so he's hopeful that we'd be able to get something from that uh, to continue to help with that so looking at uh, you know a lot of different opportunities to really make this a cost-neutral venture that will have a high value to the community so turn it back over to you all right um, we have a need to vote the new school building committee membership um, the school building is built and as things change every year people step off the committee people retire um, there's a need to remove certain members from the school building committee so Marie Altieri is retiring Dave Ertolino is retiring Lucia Sullivan uh, the principal Douglas is leaving and Amy Krishnamurthy is obviously retired from the school committee so um, we are replacing Dave's position with our with our new director of finance and operations Sherry Matthews as of July 20 July 1st 2023 so we need a motion to remove do you want to say anything about it or yeah go ahead. I'll say a couple of words um, so you know the building project we've obviously been substantially complete um, for a long period of time there's some ongoing work that will continue to take place in to throughout the summer and into the fall. Um, we anticipate that within the next week, we're gonna actually be paving um, the gate side of the parking lot. Paving will, work will continue uh, over the summer on the parking lot that will be on the Elm Street side. Um, we are also resurfacing the basketball courts um, that were CPC funded along with the district. Um, so those will be refreshed over the summer and then available for use in the fall. Um, and then we have a new softball field that they're constructing right now on the Elm Street side where Douglas used to be. That uh, will be seeded in the fall, but it actually takes a whole year of growth before you can use a field after it's seeded. So um, it will be done with construction this fall, but not the actual you know, usability uh, that we'd like to see. Um, from a building committee perspective, at this point, there's no more design work. The only thing we're doing from a building committee perspective is looking at the invoices um, from the project manager um, that's submitted through our you know, contractor that we have. Um, that's certainly nowhere near the level of involvement that we need, uh, particularly for our principals, things like that. There are some required members of a building committee, um, like a finance director for the district has to be on that, so we're replacing Dave with Sherry. But what we're really looking to do is pare down that building committee um, from a staff perspective to you know the minimum that we need in order to keep the project going we're really entering the closeout phase of the project so we just don't see that we need to continue to add new members to that so we're just asking for a vote on the proposed membership that's in your packet tonight move to approve the Acton Boxborough School Building Committee member list as posted in our packet seconded sorry any discussion you have something to say no okay all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. That passes unanimously. Beth? That was an exciting first vote, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> Dave, it's your turn. Good evening. I apologize that we don't have uh, slides tonight because somebody, you're looking at him, didn't do slides tonight. So, Dave, this is so disappointing. How are our new members going to understand? Or are you just letting them down lightly since it won't be you anymore? I, <laughs> I have so few opportunities left. I really am upset with myself that I missed this one. But. We'll we have forgive to you, just I guess. Leave it at that. I'm very sad that there won't be a I, meme at I the know, end of this I know. Yeah. Well, thank you for pointing that out too. But 
Um, you have the materials that I'm going to just fly through that were scanned uh, in your packet. The memo is the first thing. It's a number of pages long. I'm not going to rehash it. This is all this material was reviewed with budget subcommittee. Uh, just for some, Beth, if I just hit the down arrow or, oh, it's the, okay, I got it. Dave, can you press the plus sign at the top too? It's just hard to see from here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And keep going. Keep going. Yeah. This would be so much easier if you had slides, just saying. Yeah, there's that. Let me just see what's gonna happen here. Nope, okay. It's the best we got. Um, so just a real quick summary. Um, the, the operating budget uh, has been reviewed through three quarters of fiscal 23, and this memo summarizes our findings and our projections of where the district will end up at year end. So revenues, you can see we've, we've uh, grown in the projected variance from Q2 from uh, 771,000 to over a million dollar projected surplus in revenues. Uh, it's primarily in interest rates which continues to drive up interest income for the district and based on recent news, the rates could still be higher before year end. Um, reminder, every time uh, I tell you that we're, we're making out to the good in interest income, I want to also remind you that we are in year three of a 30 year uh, bond for payment of, of that new school at a, at a fixed interest rate of about 2%. So the, the increase in interest rates won't hurt any of the existing district's uh, debt. So we're currently projecting a very substantial uh, surplus in revenue. For expenditures, the requirement is that we break even. The goal is about, as I explain in the memo and go through the various uh, categories, is about a $200,000 turn back based on typical results of, cl of the closing process, especially the, the liquidating of encumbrances as we, as we get nearer to year end. The memo goes through each of the budget categories and shows the projected year end variances in each of those admin categories with the measures that we have uh, to close what's currently projected as deficits. So when the year is closed, I'm thinking that the district will settle at about a million two uh, turn back, which, is the, uh, which includes both revenues and expenditures. I'm sorry, there's, there's no other way to get through this than, than this way. Um, and about a million two of turn back is, is consistent with the district's average uh, since full regionalization, as, as we've done in, in analyses of uh, e and I've also given you a summary, just a capsule summary of the major, um, finally it fits on one screen, uh, the major revolving funds and noting that there are, there are no major issues in, uh, in these funds. I'll continue unless there are any questions on the memo. Dave, can you talk a little bit about athletics as a revolving fund? I know that's an area of concern that we may come back to the committee on later this year. Yeah, so athletics, I said no major issues. Athletics, as of the end of the third quarter, is, is in a deficit position, a fairly minor one. There's still a season to go. Um, but we've, my department and Steve um, Martin, the athletic director, have been, have been discussing where we think it's going to be projected and it'll probably come in um, worse than, than what you see here. You, they had no cushion, excuse me, to begin the year. They ran at a, at a fairly sl small deficit last year and so there isn't any cushion 
to uh, alleviate a deficit in this year. Um, I've, I'm working with Steve to put together a comprehensive presentation of where athletics has come from, where we are now, what the budget is for next year, statistics such as participation, athletic fees and things like family caps, how do they compare with other districts, how do they, uh, how could they um, secure a better financial picture for athletics if they were adjusted and that will be at one of the one of the next couple of meetings. Okay. Um, I'm I'm going to interject here just as we're talking about it and sort of cover one of the conversations we had at Budget Sub, particularly with regards to the expenditures part of the memo. So Dave points out in the memo quite clearly that um, if you were to look per report, we have overspent by about a million based on each individual budget line. But we have the opportunity to reclassify that, and what we vote as a, as a is a bottom line budget for the district, and the administration has the opportunity to move those funds into the appropriate areas to make things even out. Um, we had a, a fairly deep discussion about that in Budget Sub, and I'm happy to talk to people more in depth about that, but I think the, the point here is to say that this is somewhat atypical for this year, driven a lot by employee costs, HR costs, salaries. Um, and it's, it was atypical. We did dive into it a lot in Budget Sub, and I think it was just important to provide that context here. Not necessarily something we need to go through in depth during this meeting, but it is something that the Budget Sub did review as part of our meeting. You know, two of the biggest cost centers that we, we talked about with Budget Sub, and we've actually talked about with this group at different times during the year, too. Um, one was special education assistance. Um, we had a number of students that had moved into the district after the budget process last year. Um, and as you know, you know, if a student has an IEP, those are le that's a legally binding document with a family, um, and we're required to provide those services. When we think about um, the staffing levels in special education, we actually look at all of the IEPs we have for our students, and we look at the number of minutes and how services have to be delivered. And if we don't have enough um, staff to provide the minutes of service, then we actually have to add staff to make sure that we do that because we have that legal obligation. So we had a number of students last year um, that had moved in, circumstances had changed, IEP services had changed um, after the budget process. So there was about two hundred and seventy-five to three hundred thousand dollars worth of special education costs that came in after the budget process. Um, in terms of assistant hours. And then the other area that's been really challenging for us is in substitutes. Um, we are seeing a period of time where a lot of medical procedures had been deferred during the pandemic um, for staff and those catch up. Um, but certainly, you know, substitutes was an area of the budget that we were really challenged on this year. Um, and again, two things that I know we've talked about at different times with the committee, but this is, you know, a way that that has come home to roost, so to speak. Not to pick an argument, budget. one of the first things you said is we had overspent by a million. And I think you will agree with we haven't overspent. This is what we are projecting. And the spreadsheet that is an Excel spreadsheet, no, not much mystery to it, that my department uses to project costs, the, it, there are 800 line items on it, each with a budget. It, without better information, what they do most often is if an account, I'll give you just a clear example, if account has a $2,000 line item to it and there has not been anything charged to it by this time of year, it's probably still sitting at an expected end of year cost of 2000 because we don't have any information otherwise. That's a lot of the stuff that falls off the cliff by, between now and the end of year as we do the closeout process. The million is what's projected at the end of the year with all of those conservative projections built in and a number of reclassifications not yet made. You typically don't see the sausage being made in that detail from me because what I have done is taken the, the original recipe, if you, if you will, of the finance department spreadsheet and dis through discussion with the budget, uh, the budget administrators and just information that I know, 
done a more refined projection of where I think we're going to be at year end. This is an unusual year for the reasons Peter just enumerated, and I wanted to be transparent about it rather than just, you know, doing one of these and, and hiding it, and I, as I explained to Budget Subcommittee. So just wanted to make sure that, that the representation of what's happening is, is accurate. Thank you, Adam. Dave, can I ask a quick question yeah. just about the athletic fund? Yes. So is that mostly because we had two years of COVID, we didn't have sports, we didn't have athletics, we've got an increasing number of students that can't afford and ask for a, a waiver on, on the athletic fee, but not because we've spent money on reclassifying mascot <coughs> items. No, uh, generally correct. What I would say the COVID impact is in the beginning balance. So we basically, we're basically in a break even position starting this year. We have no cushion. If you look at what's up on the screen now, every other one of these programs has a pretty significant fund, starting fund balance in relation to the size of its program. So for example, Extended Day started the year with a million dollars in, the, in the, the program fund balance. It's a big program. It, it takes in and expends over a million dollars a year. Integrated Pre-K, it only has $43,000 fund balance, but it's in the hundreds of thousands in and out. The, the outlier is athletics that had no safety net, if you will, this year. Yes, they are. There, there is absolutely more uh, financial hardship waivers, and I'm expecting Steve uh, to provide me and, uh, and for us to work on a presentation that summarizes it in more detail for you. And so uh, with, the, with the memo done, the memo was intended to summarize some of the individual, and there's an eye chart um, information for you. The revenue uh, spreadsheet that you got breaks down the components. Anything shown in pink on this spreadsheet in the projected variance column, second from the right in the numbers, uh, means that there's been a meaningful change since our projection in the second quarter. And is, an, and is explained in the notes at the bottom. The uh, overview is what it is. That was summarized already by me. And here are all the pages of the expenditure line item details. Um, we've been doing it in this manner for a couple of years now and not had any uh, suggested changes. I think it's a pretty helpful uh, explanation of where costs are being charged to versus budget for each category in some meaningful detail. Um, another small one, again, I've, I've talked about, I, I capsule summarized uh, special revenue accounts above. And there are three pages of those. And then the last things, and I, and I provided you with the uh, Munis details. Again, just in the, in the category of transparency, here's the information that we have. I summarize it, I, I narrative it, in a, put it in a narrative in a memo, uh, but I'm, I'm providing you with all the details. So the last couple of things I have, um, this is the most recent cherry sheet estimate and it was submitted after the House budget proposal. There's good news and bad news. The good news is that in several of these categories, most notably regional tra school transportation, you can see that there's a significant, uh, I need glasses to do this, ironically. Oops. Regional school transportation the previous estimate in the governor's local aid the governor's local aid proposal was 2.075 at 100% reimbursement they're estimating at over 2.7 million that's the good news that that would be found money relative to what was used to construct the budget for FY24 next year the bad news is if you read it yesterday or the day before is that state tax collections went off the cliff uh, for the month of April. And now there is concern about 
I, I guess everything is on the table from the standpoint of the state. They're in a, a deficit position for the first time in several years. I would assume that 100% regional transportation was put in the budget based on optimistic revenue projections. We won't know what's, what's going to happen for another. Probably this month the Senate budget comes out and next month the conference committee takes place and the final budget is voted. So good news and bad news. And lastly, the E&D letter which was received in February and is finally just again being presented to you. Just under three million is the, uh, is the total amount which works out to a 2.9% reserve balance in the E&D fund. And for those new members, the E&D fund is like your free cash fund in a town, right? Similar? Yes. Okay. Anyone have any questions for Dave? Dave, I just want to say I always love seeing the Munis sheets. There's, there's no retort to that. So <laughs> thank you very much, Dave. Even without the slides, we still appreciate you. All right, so, so next up we have some updates on the superintendent annual evaluation. Do you want to introduce that? Do you want to go first? Which one of you wants to do? Peter. So, hello again, everyone. Uh, so in your packet, um, a couple of documents for you. And I'll just go back to last meeting, and I know a lot of you were watching, even if you weren't sitting in the seats that you're in now. Uh, but at the last meeting, I gave you an overview of the actual process used to evaluate the superintendent. Um, and so I've included in, um, you know, in an email to you, you also received a editable, um, either a Word doc form or a Google doc based on your preference of the individual evaluation that members complete. The way the school committee has set this up um, is that the members who served during the superintendent's you know, evaluation term are the members that complete that evaluation process. Um, and so that would include, you know, Evelyn and Tessa here, but also the members that aren't with us tonight still participate in the evaluation process. Um, the evaluations are completed by the members who are on the committee at the time. Um, they are, you know, sent to uh, the chair. In this case, Adam has agreed to step in um, and be one person. And they're also sent to my administrative assistant so that she can actually make sure that everything is filed appropriately. Um, once they're submitted, uh, the chair has two weeks um, essentially to you know, gather all that information and compile one composite evaluation for the committee that reflects all of the information that was shared with them. Um, that evaluation is then brought to a school committee meeting. In this case, it will be the June 8th meeting um, and is read aloud into the formal record for the evaluation for this, the school year for the superintendent. Um, I still receive all the copies of the individual evaluations. Um, so, you know, I'm able to, you know, understand feedback from each of the members. Um, but the one composite eval becomes the formal evaluation of the superintendent for the school year. So just to refresh process, um, I'm presenting some information for you tonight. Um, obviously, this is not really the only thing that goes into the evaluation process. I think one of the things that it's easy to lose sight of is we do so much work around district goals, um, which is certainly an important part of the superintendent's evaluation, but the idea of any employee evaluation is it's an evaluation of the employee's performance. And so ultimately at the heart of that for um, a superintendent, it typically includes all of the information that you get through the year um, and your impressions personally of 
the superintendent's performance and your assessment of the progress that we made toward our goals. And then those are combined for that overall evaluation of how you do it. I just always like to remind people, and I think, you know, as educators, where the goals have been still relatively new, and when I say relatively new in education, I mean the last, you know, 10 years, um, <laughs> that's still fairly young in education terms. Um, but, you know, there can be a, sometimes a struggle to find the right balance between overall evaluation of performance and progress on goals. So I just want to highlight that for you. Um, you know, I try to give you a memo that's a little bit of an assessment from um, my school year and just a look back on things that happened. So you'll see here in this memo, there's a link to the actual goals update. Um, it's also in the packet, so you can certainly take a look at that. But um, I also tried to give you some ideas of other things that have happened over the course of the year that you're certainly welcome to also consider. Anything that we've done over the course of the year is fair game um, for my evaluation, um, and you're welcome to comment on that. I just tried to put in some things that I think you know were particularly impactful across the district. So you know, just going back to the beginning of the school year, we opened the new school. Um, that was very exciting. We had a great community event around that. Um, we have been very successful in our leadership searches this year, um, where we have a you know, deputy superintendent, finance director. We actually just hired a facilities coordinator um, who is coming from the city of Somerville, where he's been responsible for over 40 buildings in that city. Um, exceptional references. Um, we're thrilled to be bringing him on board, and he's starting in a couple of weeks um, as our interim steps down. Um, we brought in cartwheel care um, to expedite mental health services to students. We're excited about that. We, um, a, a kind of a side project of mine has been to think about our engagement, particularly with our seniors in the community. Um, and so I went over to the senior center at the beginning of the year, um, just spent time with our seniors, talked about the district, talked about our kids, answered questions um, from our senior citizens. We then uh, actually organized a day for our seniors to come to the high school, and we did a short tour of the high school, uh, but then they had an opportunity to hear from the high school principal a little bit about what was going on in the high school this year, and then eat lunch with our students. Um, and we had a bit of a conversation just sharing back and forth between our students and senior citizens what was school like then and now. Um, and then we have also been working with the Council on Aging and we're piloting a uh, senior reading program um, for our elementary students. Um, and so Conant and Blanchard are actually going to be piloting that for us this spring. So we have some representation in both towns. Um, and I've been seeing the emails go back and forth between the Council on Aging and the principals to schedule dates and times. So, you know, um, really wanted to focus on that population because I don't think that our, uh, it's, clear to our seniors how our schools can add value to seniors and how our seniors can add value for our students as well. So I uh, want to try and build that relationship. Um, we had done a lot of work and I want to credit Deb um, and our principals and the literacy steering team. Uh, there was a lot of educator input that we solicited um, to select our new core literacy program. Um, this has been a long time in the making. We have slowly built out um, our early literacy program, specifically around phonics and phonemic awareness, um, and that has shown in our data a lot of improvement, but we knew that there was going to have to be another step to select that core literacy program that goes to word study, comprehension, vocabulary. Um, that has been selected and we're going to be in an implementation phase next year. It'll probably be a two-year implementation plan where we do you know, one or two of the modules at most next year, and then you know, finish the implementation the following year, but we're very excited about that. Um, we certainly had a challenging budget process. I think for me, uh, communication with staff and families was important. Um, as you know, superintendent's updates provided regular information about the budget and what was happening uh, that we sent out to families to make sure people knew what was happening um, at that end. But I also hosted um, two different budget webinars for all staff. Uh, one very early in the process before we went public with any information and then another one as we started to know what the reductions might look like uh, to make sure our staff were hearing information before our community. Um, we thought that was just being respectful, especially with reductions on the horizon. Um, we were able to pilot our first ever uh, concurrent enrollment course at the high school. It was an economics course taught by Rob Donaldson, uh, where the students in that course have the option of actually receiving college credit through uh, Middlesex Community College. Um, we've also been building out some other um, 
partnerships with other universities to try and bring some value um, for high school students in thinking about earning college credits while they're in high school. For those of you who weren't on the committee when we started talking about this, um, we all know the cost of college. I have a senior in high school. I'm looking at that cost coming up for next year. Um, but you know, for students to be able to take on some credits um, at a vastly reduced rate while they're in high school makes a lot of sense, not only from an engagement standpoint and expanding opportunities, but from a financial perspective. So we're really, you know, looking at a lot of those opportunities for our high school, and that's, you know, certainly something we need to start slow to make sure we get it right, but we'd like to expand that type of programming over the next few years for our high school kids. Um, we're currently, you know, looking at the school resource officer program. You know, that's a slow and deliberate process by intention. Um, we know from the initial feedback we got from the community during the first round of discussions that it was a topic that we needed to study in depth. Um, so the school committee chose to form a subcommittee. That's certainly something I've been supporting, um, as well as other district staff um, who are on that committee. So that's some of the work we're doing. Um, I didn't write it here, but another piece of work that we started this year um, was the coalition leadership coalition to really look at hate and bias language and speech in our schools because we've seen you know a preponderance of that that we're not comfortable with um, and it's really a persistent problem that we're we're seeing over several years um, so we're making good progress on that um, and you know we'll be excited to be able to give you a little bit more update probably at the next meeting um, I've been doing a lot of work myself um, with the Massachusetts School Superintendents Association. Um, they have a racial equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, foundation series and application strand, um, as well as um, I attended the district management group's uh, annual superintendent summit uh, with Deb Bookus and Jen Faber. Um, and the two focuses that we really looked at there were strategic budgeting and academic return on investment, um, which is really the process of making sure that we're funding programs that have a high rate on return for student learning. Um, and how do we make sure that when we're investing citizens' money that we're doing it smartly and in ways that are going to return uh, value from a student perspective. So that's something we looked at as well. Um, one of the things I think, you know, based on some of the work that we've done over the last several years, um, we also have had an opportunity to kind of expand the district's profile with other communities. Um, so I had an opportunity to present um, through the Massachusetts Superintendents Association. I was one of the presenters on a Wednesday webinar uh, looking at kind of developing a guiding coalition for equity work. Um, we then had um, a panel from the district present at the MASC, MASS conference, um, and that was building a sustainable leadership model for culturally responsive schools. Um, and then I also co-presented with Cartwheel Care at the District Management Group's National Summit um, looking at school community partnership to expand mental health services. Um, so I linked those presentations in there if that's something that you're interested in taking a look at. Um, you know, I also try, in addition to just telling you the stuff that happened over the course of the year, give you some highlights um, that I thought you know, were either personal successes or successes of the district, but also areas that I think we can continue to focus on or I personally can continue to focus on. So that was the second half of this memo. Um, I think certainly you know, a really challenging budget process, but trying to do it with transparency, I thought we did a reasonably good job with that. I'm not gonna say it was stellar, but I think you know, we were clear with our staff, we were upfront, we were honest and transparent in communication. Um, this was also, to me, a personally exciting year because we've been talking for three or four years about building out an MTSS framework. And you know, some of the members, Amy's not here tonight, but who were on the committee nine, <laughs> for nine years know that it was six or seven years ago that we did the initial study um, with George Batch, who was out of Michigan, um, who came in and really highlighted that we didn't have any type of a a data-informed process for looking at student learning as a district, and that was something that was going to be a priority. And we've spent the better part of four and five years really planning to get to an implementation stage, and it's been a lot of work, a lot of budgetary transition, um, and thinking about the types of roles that we have in our schools. It's been thinking about building out a data culture 
Um, it's been, you know, uh, making sure that we have really good evidence-based tier one instruction that's consistent across all our elementary schools. So the, I, when I say tier one, I mean our core literacy program, the work around um, dyslexia and phonics awareness um, has been a big one for us. Moving to one math program that serves all, across all of our elementary schools is really important. And then building in the data systems and the assessment systems that can support educators in looking at that data to actually now impact kids. There's a lot of work for this district that went into that um, from our staff over the better part of three or four years. But this is the year that we're actually seeing that now start to take hold. So um, we're certainly not there, but it's an exciting first step for us. Um, cartwheel care, we've talked a lot about that. I'm just very excited. We were the first ever partner Cartwheel Care had. Um, we took that leap of faith that they'd be a good partner for us and you know that has returned you know well beyond the expectations that we had going into the partnership. Um, I think that you know due to the really heavy lift of our staff uh, we are starting to be seen as a leader in the DEI work across the state. We're having districts ask us how we're approaching different topics, the work that we're doing. Um, it doesn't mean that we've solved the problems but it means that I think we're being seen as we're putting the place the systems that are likely to yield the results that we want. Um, but it's really generational work on a lot of the DEI work. Um, so that's slow and steady. Um, I mentioned the Welcome Center. You're going to hear about that uh, at the next meeting, but I'm very, very excited about that. Um, you know, we have a really growing population of families entering that are coming from all over the world um, and different parts of the world than we've traditionally seen here at AB. Um, and to be able to provide a Welcome Center that can centralize services um, and language services, language assessment, EL screening right up front um, so that kids are in a better spot when they hit school um, is going to be a, a I think a real positive step for our district. And then the grand opening of the Boardwalk Campus. Um, we actually have an opportunity on Monday. We are hosting um, the joint committee uh, from the Mass Legislature on, there's too many words in this one that I'm going to remember, but it's everything from telecommunications to the environment and sustainability um, to really take a look at some of the highlights of the Boardwalk Campus um, and share with them the sustainability path that AB has been on for the last four or five years and where we want to head over the next three and talk about the type of legislative support that we certainly will welcome um, in helping us get there. So that's happening next week. Um, that's just a nice kudos to you know the citizens for funding that fantastic building. In terms of, I think, opportunities for growth and areas for focus that we need to think about next year, um, one, management of expenses. We've now reduced our budget significantly, and in part of doing those budget reductions, it means we have really left ourselves much less margin for error. We trimmed budgets over the last few years as well, and I think what you're seeing in the expense side of the budget this year is there's just not a lot of room for error in this. Um, so we really have to think about how we're managing the expense side of the budget as we go into next year, and that's going to be a focus of mine. Um, want to highlight that. I think transparent communication um, around some of the big strategic work that we do. Um, I, that's an area that I'm not really ha as happy as I'd like to be at this point with. Um, and I, I heard a really nice definition at a recent workshop that I was at around what is transparency. And they talked about the difference between honesty and transparency, and it, it made me think a little bit differently. They defined honesty as telling someone the truth when they ask a question. They define transparency as thinking deeply enough about the people that you're working with that you anticipate the questions that they'll have and provide the information that they want before they have to ask. Um, and so how do we shift toward that? I will say I'm also a bit nervous about highlighting you know, transparent communication because we just unfunded the only position in the district um, in our special project position that was actually dedicated to communication. So it will mean that we have to actually rethink how we're communicating. Um, and how we embed some of that work into other roles of the district. So it needs to be done, but I'm not sure about how it's going to look at this point. Um, 
Presence in schools and classrooms, I'm hoping to improve next year. Um, I think I've always met with principals on a monthly basis in their school, and then we were able to walk classrooms. I think as we've come out of the pandemic, um, I'm spending a lot of time I'm finding with principals, but we're talking through different issues around supporting students and some of the challenges that they're seeing in their schools. But it's taking a lot of time away from me being able to be in classrooms as well. And so next year, I've already actually booked out all my days for the year. My calendar's all set for next year at this point. Um, <laughs> But uh, in addition to my monthly, you know, hour, hour and a half meetings with every principal, um, I actually have every Monday for the first half of the day set aside for the whole school year. And I have my whole rotation of schools that I'm going into um, where it's really just focused on classrooms and teaching and learning and kind of hanging out with kids and making sure I have a good eye to what's going on in the district. So that's something I want to look at for next year. Um, I think needless to say, the development of high performance leadership teams, this was actually in my entry report from when I started in 2018. We had had a lot of turnover in school committee, um, turnover in superintendent, turnover in leadership team at that point. Um, but we're seeing that same type of turnover both at the school committee level and leadership team. I think we have to spend time talking about what a high performing team looks like for both school committee and also for our leadership team and make sure that we have really clear agreements about the roles and responsibilities of everyone has, the ways we work together, how we communicate effectively to make sure everyone has the information that they need to fulfill their obligations. Um, and so that's something I want to highlight. And then, you know, the last thing I have to put in is balancing priorities on my calendar. You know, when I started here, the community, community facing things that the superintendent did was the joint PTSO. Um, which was a monthly meeting. We had the uh, Act and Leadership Group, which was essentially a monthly meeting for six months of the school year, maybe seven. Um, and then we had, you know, periodic attendance at finance committee meetings. But since that, you know, we've added, you know, monthly DEI family advisories. We have added an SRO subcommittee that meets every three weeks. Um, I have the AB Leadership Coalition um, for Hate and Bias Speech that's meeting every three weeks. We have, um, you know, the work now that I'm doing with senior citizens. Things are coming on the calendar, but things aren't coming off the calendar. And it's, you know, becoming increasingly difficult to manage three and four night weeks um, if the day starts at, you know, 7 a.m. on email or something like that. So uh, I'm really trying to think about how to keep a presence with all of the different groups that I need to have a presence, but it's going to have to be a more balanced look at that in order to make this a sustainable effort over a long period of time. So really, you know, I've done a lot of work with Julie and just looking at managing calendar for the next school year um, as something because if I can't, what I'm finding now is if I'm in so many different committees and meetings, um, I don't have time to actually give thought to preparing for the meetings that I'm in that need me to prepare for them um, and to do the background work. So how do we find a balance for that, um, I think is going to be important. So I just wanted to put that on your radar, that it's certainly something that you know I've been thinking about over the course of this year and just wanted to put before the committee as well. So those were a few of the things you know that I'm identifying that I want to make some shifts in my own practice um, as we go into next year. But I always look forward to you know the committee's feedback when we get to that point. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the goals update. Um, it's in your packet. As you remember, we had a mid-year update um, in March <laughs> of this year. I think it was halfway through March. Uh, so there's not a, a lot that's going to be different in this one. Um, I do want to highlight some of the language that we use in here. These were the status updates for you. Um, if you look, you know, mid-year status update was either completed, it's in process but on target, in process but we're not on target, uh, we haven't started something, or we actually decided after we set the goal that this wasn't something we really want to do, um, and we deferred it. At the end of the year, there's some different categories, and I just want to highlight a couple of language things that are, you know, nuanced for us, um, but completed means we've really finished that and we don't intend, it doesn't need to be continued. It's, it's a discrete item that you can now check off a list and it doesn't have to come back. Um, ongoing means, yeah, we've actually done what we said we were going to do, but this has to be ongoing work. So you'll likely see it again in the next year's plan uh, because one year is not going to be sufficient to have the depth of implementation that it really needs. Um, not completed but continuing means we didn't get through all of the action steps we wanted, um, but we do intend to continue it so that we make the progress we want. Um, 
not completed, discontinued, means we got into the project and we didn't feel it ended up having the value that we hoped it would have, so we're actually gonna just discontinue it before we expend good energy on a bad project. Um, or not a bad project, but a project that isn't meeting expectations. Um, and then deferred means that, you know, similar to the mid-year update, we just decided early on this was not something that was gonna be feasible. Um, Overall, I'll just say, and as I said, I'm not going to go through all of this. With the goals, we felt pretty good about what we had done. I will say with the SEL goal, um, you'll see this is one where I, we have a couple of areas that we said not completed and continuing, particularly around embedding SEL instructional practices in our curriculum. And this is something that our leadership team has been talking a lot about this year, particularly with the rollout of the new literacy curriculum, is how do we move from seeing social emotional learning as a silo or you know, um, culturally responsive teaching practices as its own silo or literacy as it, or math as their own independent silos, but how do we actually think about throughout all of our work around literacy, these practices are actually embedded. Um, and we think looking at a new curriculum adoption, there's really an opportunity to think about embedding those. So that's work that will actually go into next year. Um, and then the other one, um, you know, I think if you talk to our principals and leaders, uh, they would say that, you know, we used an existing position last year. Um, we had an elementary psychology coordinator that we kind of promoted into a role of being a district-wide SEL mental and behavioral health coordinator. Um, she still has to coordinate elementary psychology. Um, so she really actually only has 0.2 of her job that's devoted to this other role, but she's being used incredibly heavily, probably to the you know tune of 0.8 of her job <laughs> would, would really be on this. Um, and we have to think about, you know, we don't have the funds to expand her role. So how do we actually really clearly define what she is involved with um, so that it's not an overwhelming job and she can actually impact something well? Um, those were a couple areas, but otherwise, I think as you look through this, you'll, you will see that we've made a lot of the progress that we intended to. There are some hyperlinks in there. If there were presentations that we did on topics throughout the year, particularly from the beginning of the year, I put those links in um, so that you would have access to those. But um, happy to just take any questions or you know initial thoughts, comments. All right, so new members, you just take note. You don't have to do that this, any of this this year. You can just learn and watch. But do any current members that are responsible for writing his evaluation have follow-up questions for Peter? Rebecca? Um, could you say a little bit more about how the district is being seen by others as a DEI leader? Um, I don't know if there was something specific in the packet that I missed or... Yeah, so, uh, you know, this I think goes to speak on two, two fronts. One, we were invited by the Mass Association of School Committees um, to present around some of the work around the leadership structure we had built around DEI. Um, and in particular, what we focused on um, going into this year that has, I think, been seen pretty positively by other districts is expanding teacher leader roles around DEI. So, you know, going into this year, we had always had kind of a standalone DEI position, but the person, you know, kind of became a unicorn in the district, where it was one person with a very specific role, but there was no system of support around them or no structure for how they would impact what goes on in classrooms. Um, and so I think that can be really challenging. And so one of the shifts we made was to add the culturally responsive teacher leaders this year um, that have been working with Michelle Shannon from the Leadership Academy as well as Jen Faber um, to really look at data wise. So it's you know about building a culture of looking at your data, uh, but they've also been looking at Zaretta Hammond's um, culturally responsive teaching in the brain. Um, and then the teacher leaders have been going back to their schools and running professional learning opportunities for the rest of the staff. Um, so it's colleagues helping colleagues. Um, you know, look deep, more deeply into the work. We also expanded the number of seed leaders um, in the district uh, because we have that requirement for anti-bias training for staff um, within their first three years. And so this is a program that's been in existence, but we felt like we didn't have enough, well, we, not we didn't feel, we, we didn't have enough um, leaders and trainers to meet the demand of our staff um, who were getting into this training. So. Um, we did send people to the training for that, and we've significantly expanded seed leadership across the district. And again, that's another teacher leadership role um, for a lot of this work. So I think those are two of the primary levers that I think people have asked us to talk more about and how we're, we're engaging teachers in the work. 
Anyone else? All right, Adam. Okay, so as you'll see in your packet, um, I'll be collecting the information, the evaluations. We got an email earlier this week with a Word document uh, with this supporting information and the rubric. Um, for our new committee members, like Tessa said, you're not required, but uh, I, I would spend the time and look through it just to familiarize yourself with the process so that when you start next year, you know what you're looking for. Um, today is May the 4th, be with you. Uh, these are due to myself and Julie, please, in two weeks, May 18th. So you have all of the information has been presented to you now, so please take the next two weeks to complete the evaluations. Email them to me and to Julie uh, in, in Peter's office. Um, and we'll come back in two weeks and I'll report on exactly those who have not sent, no, I will. Uh, uh, I just it, the sooner we can get this, the the sooner then the the work of compiling all of this. And so, what we'll present to Peter at our last meeting of the year on June eighth will be a, a, a summary of all of the comments uh, in in written form. Um, additionally, I want to invite any members of the public uh, to also send any of their comments uh, in around the um, evaluation of the superintendent. Uh, I'll extend that uh, date here since it's in the agenda uh, to June 1st. So any of the members of the public who have feedback on the superintendent, they can also send that feedback to both me and Julie Lalumiere um, by June 1st, please. Thanks, Peter. All right, so we're already at the time of the evening when we do subcommittee and members reports. Um, Andrew, would you like to report on community engagement? The Acton Boxborough Regional School District Community Engagement Subcommittee met on April 14th, 2023. Our focus continues to be on creating greater connections with the Acton Boxborough community. Ongoing work within our session was focused on methods of informing the public on town meeting and the importance of the vote. We're not taking credit for the unanimous acceptance of the budget on the Acton town meeting, but we are happy with the result. Our next meeting will occur tomorrow around 10.45 a.m. Back to you, Tessa. Thanks. Uh, Adam, budget? So yet again, what you heard earlier this evening from Dave was an excellent summary of our budget subcommittee meeting. Uh, it wasn't this week, it was last week, which is why we're all off a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward. I, I don't think we have any more budget subcommittee meetings planned for the rest of this year, so um, we probably will see in our consent agenda at some point a vote for the school committee to vote the minutes of our last meeting. And your big success was that at Acton Town Meeting, the budget was passed unanimously. Indeed. Next Monday at Boxborough. All right. Uh, Liz, would you like to report on Leadership Coalition to Combat Hate and Bias Speech? Yes. Uh, we have met uh, a few times now, and it's a really great group of uh, maybe about 25 people? 25? 30, about 30. Yep. Um, Peter has been absolutely excellent, excellent in communicating to everyone, structuring our meetings so that they are as successful as they can be. And one thing that a lot of the members have noted specifically is just the amount of student participation and support that is really helping. This is a slow going process, you know, there's a lot of op opinions, there's a lot of problems to be identified and tackled, and I think that we're doing excellent work. If I may jump in also. Yeah, for sure, a go right ahead. Uh, I just also want to note that on the 25th of April, the Leadership Coalition to Hate, uh, to Combat Hate and Bias Speech at, met, and we worked on drafting a, prob a, uh, a problem statement in the theory of action. Much discussion took place around crafting a problem statement which addresses an underlying culture that exists in the Acton Boxborough school community which allows hate and bias speech to be perpetuated in our community. As someone who is actively involved in the Jewish community at large, uh, the work that is being performed by this leadership coalition is deeply meaningful to me. As such, it should be noted that during the course of this past school year, here at the AB schools, there have been a recorded five anti-Semitic incidences that have taken place on school property over the course of the year. It is extremely troubling that anti-Semitism trends continue upwards and that apathy throughout the community has continued to spread. As a result, there is planning underway for a march against anti-Semitism tentatively scheduled in June. 
This is a joint venture between the ADL and the Kulanu Group at Congregation Beth Elohim. I'm working with the Kulanu Group, and it's my hope that members of this body will attend and show up and show support to the Jewish community at large. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Go ahead. Sure. You know, I just want to expand a little bit on, you know, some of the problem statement that we've been working on because we, I, I think, probably have spent the better part of six hours um, of meetings. Really, you know, when you have 30 individuals uh, that encompass, you know, middle school and high school age students, we have um, community members in there at large who, who may or may not be associated with the school. Um, the rabbi, new rabbi from Beth Elohim is involved in this. Uh, we also have um, some of our teachers. We have administrators um, from the schools. And, you know, everyone's going to see a little, the problem at its core a little bit differently, right? And one of the things that we thought was very important was to first spend time sharing stories about different acts of bias or hate that we're seeing in schools um, and making sure that anyone who is willing to share something had an opportunity to lend that perspective. But then we use that to actually work you know, in small groups and then in larger groups around just defining a problem statement. I think oftentimes we rush through that and we try and just get solutions in place, uh, but the solutions aren't necessarily matched to what the group feels a problem is. Um, so we spent time and we actually came up with some really specific uh, elements of the problem that we all felt like we could commit to and the group reached consensus um, on these at the last meeting so I just want to share some of the things that we came to. Ben had um, read kind of the first part of it which is you know there is an underlying culture that exists um, in the Acton Boxborough school community which allows hate and bias speech to be perpetuated um, and then we said it includes the following characteristics and we're still wordsmithing some of this so you know you may see a word change um, but individuals engage in a range of hate and bias speech or behaviors that serve to dehumanize members of our community who belong to marginalized groups these can include and do include jokes and slurs that ridicule or reinforce stereotypes behaviors that target demean or harass individuals um, and public displays of hate that target whole communities um, so there's really a range of these everything from jokes and innuendo all the way up through overt acts of hate, hate toward communities, um, and we're seeing all of it. We have hate and bias speech taking place in different settings, um, and it's often being influenced and amplified by this use of social media. Um, the group felt that there was a need to call out social media and the prevalence of that as something that we had to pay attention to in any solution we put in place. We also felt that some individuals in our community are either minimizing, dismissing, or normalizing the existence of hate and bias speech. Um, in our schools or in our community. And then one of the things that we really spent a lot of time talking about, we feel that there's either inconsistent or insufficient responses by educators and students to interrupt the hate or bias speech in the moment that it occurs. Um, enough that we're actually modifying behaviors and changing the underlying culture. And so we've really talked about this idea of making sure people feel well prepared to interrupt bias as it's occurring and not let that sit initially. I think, you know, that does two things when we don't interrupt it um, in the moment. One, it can serve to reinforce the behavior um, for people either the perpetrator of the behavior or people who are bystanders to the behavior because they don't see a quick action and swift action. But I think the other thing it does is it sends a message to the target of the behavior that it's not important um, or the person isn't taking it seriously. And so we want to really think about all four of those elements and the solutions. So the work we're going to do now from here to the end of the year with that group is actually now more action oriented. We're at going to look at, okay, how do we turn the problem statement into a really coherent theory of action that we then have very clear and measurable um, action steps that we want to do. So I wanted to just take time on that tonight to just bring you up to speed on some of the work that we're trying to do with that group. Um, it's a great group of individuals um, that's very, very broadly representative of our students and our community at large. So um, it's actually, you know, one of the more fun, enjoy, even though we're talking about a hard topic. It's actually a fun group to work with uh, because people are bringing, I think, a lot of themselves to the work um, and, you know, we're having great dialogue. 
Also, I want to thank you for your leadership during the course of these uh, meetings. I've attended two of the four so far um, as a result of scheduling conflicts. I really see the, the benefit and the merit of this group continuing to meet, continuing to address these issues. And, um, you know, again, thank you, Peter, for your leadership throughout this. Sure, Leela, go right ahead. Um, I think you said it, and I think I missed it. What's the expected timeline for this deliverable of kind of strategy, knowing you know, that things shift? Uh, you, one of the things I want to have the group talk about is having um, a, a timeline of deliverables, right? You're not going to change a culture in three months, right? But you can have some action steps that you can take within three months. So um, uh, one thing, and it's, it's getting out ahead of the group a little bit, but we are in talks with the Anti-Defamation League to bring the World of Difference program into the junior high next year. Um, and they've actually agreed to move us up on the priority list of schools um, to be able to do that because they have a long lit wait list of schools that are trying to get in to the program and they can only train so many schools a year. Um, but we are partnering with them. We've been able to, coming out of the pandemic, continue with the World of Difference program at the high school. I think there's opportunities to look at how we deliver that program um, to try and expand the impact of that. And then we want to leave a lot of space for other types of things we're doing. But we also know that if we don't plan something, you know, starting three weeks ago and a month ago, it won't be there for the fall, especially like with the ADL. Are there any other questions? Evelyn? So does this group include student representatives as well? Yeah, it does. Um, so, you know, one of the things we, or, or I set out when I formed the group is, I didn't just want to have representatives from different places in the community. I actually asked people who had leadership influence in different organizations within the community to be part of this so that they could bring that influence back. And so, you know, like a lot of our student groups at the high school and our affinity groups, they all have one of the leadership members of the affinity group who's actually serving on this um, leadership coalition. Similarly, um, you know, we have people who are active in the DEI work in various aspects of the community or at the state level who are also serving on this leadership coalition. Um, we think that's the best way to get the resources together, but then also engage the number of stakeholders that we're going to need to actually make the change. Um, and just to let you know, Evelyn, like the student participation is absolutely critical. And it's been the student participation in this has been critical and very, very thoughtful. Thank you. Um, I just have a question. So Ben, you just mentioned that there, in the topic of anti-Semitism, you're disappointed to see there's apathy in the community. People are normalizing the behavior is what you're seeing. Uh, I wonder if there is a um, possibility we can bring educational resources to immigrant communities. Uh, language barrier is possibility, a contributing, contributing factor into the apathy that you're seeing and anything I can do to help, I would be happy to do so. In terms of my statement regarding apathy within the community as a whole, it's not just here in Acton. It's also within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and by and large across this nation. As we see an increase in hate, bigotry, and xenophobia here in this country as a result of a litany of issues that we really don't have the time to go into tonight, um, one thing I can say is that based off of the statistics as published by the ADL between 2021 and 2022, there has been a 50% increase in anti-Semitic attacks on school property. Jews within the community represent the greatest amount of individuals who have experienced hate uh, crimes in the United States disproportionately to any other um, religious minority group identified. Um, unfortunately, because so much of these attacks go on, and whether we see it in the news, whether it's you know put out by faculty and administration, the more that this happens, my personal belief is that the more that we get numb to the fact of these actions taking place. So therefore, it's not 
any particular community. It's not any particular person or group that is apathetic. It's just the fact that there is so much of it out there. We're becoming more and more numb to the fact that, you know, only a generation or two ago, when you saw a swastika painted on the side of a school, it would create outrage within the community. Now it's just like, oh great, another act of hate. And that's where my statement and my, my perspective comes in. Thank you to all of you. It sounds like very meaningful work that will be going forward. Um, SRO committee. Yeah, I have a brief update from the School Resource Officer Subcommittee. Um, we will be coming to our June 8th meeting with a, a more complete summary of the work that we've been doing to date. Uh, I think the, the most important update that I have to provide is that uh, as much as we wanted the work to be done by the end of this year, there's a significant amount of work that will remain. So uh, we'll provide an update at the end of this year of where we're at. Um, more urgently, um, we've had a couple members of the committee uh, step down, uh, including one of our school committee members, Amy, will no longer be um, serving as a member of the, the school committee. Uh, and so I wanted to take this opportunity to open up to anybody who's sitting on the school committee now and who will be serving for the balance of next year as well. Uh, if you have a, a renewed interest in joining as a school committee member, please send me an email and we will um, provide an update again at most likely the next meeting um, uh, as to any reorganization or, or renewed membership list of that subcommittee as well. So anyone on the school committee who's interested in joining the school resource officer subcommittee, please send me an email. Thank you. And so just as a note for new committee members, the new Boxborough members, hopefully, will join at the next school committee meeting, which will be May 18th, and that's when you will go through the entire reorganization of the school committee. Um, and the way that works for new members is uh, first you'll elect a chair and vice chairs and then there will be a summer workshop and um, you'll have time to consider the different roles that you might want to serve on the school committee so subcommittees um, all these things that we are we, we now actually have more subcommittees than we've had in, in a while doing some meaningful work um, it used to really just be budget and and um, policy that did a lot of the, the heavy lifting, but um, these two new committees, the SRO Committee and the Leadership Coalition um, for Hate and Speech, Bias Speech, we won't have a negotiation subcommittee next year, so you'll have time to consider all of those things and think about where you'd like to serve on the committee. So we only have one item on the consent agenda tonight, which makes it not really a consent agenda, but we have a need to approve the meeting minutes from 413-23. Um, you do not have to have attended a meeting to vote on the minutes. So is there a motion to approve the meeting minutes of 413-23? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Uh, all right, Adam, do you have the warrants up? <laughs> Great. Well, you said we have to be out by 8.30. So, yeah. All right. So in one breath, I move that the school committee vote to approve the below listed warrants totaling $7,376,560 and zero cents. AP vendor warrants as follows, 23-021, dated 4 2023 in the amount of $729,271.26. 23-021C, dated 4-21-2023, in the amount of $253,784.39. 23-022A, dated 4-28-2023, in the amount of $2,148,987.71. Payroll vendor warrant as follows, 23-021PR, dated 4-20-2023, in the amount of $1,220,000. $224,377.76. Payroll vendor warrant as follows, P2321 dated 420-2023 in the amount of $2,988,527.49. And student activity, ven student activity warrants as follows, 23-021SH dated 420-2023 in the amount of $25,631.39. And 23-022BL dated 427-2023 in the amount of $5,980.00. Second. Second. <laughs> Any abstentions? All right. Uh, 
Peter, is there anything you'd like to highlight in the FYI? Um, I know that in the packet there is proposed uh, school committee meeting dates for 23-24. Uh, as well as the case annual report. I know that Leela asked me ahead of the meeting if she could make a statement about something, so go right ahead. Yeah, it's sounded dramatic, but just quickly. Um, May 11th is the end of the pandemic emergency order in Massachusetts, um, and that's gonna cause significant changes depending on your insurance, um, but especially for things like COVID tests and vaccination insurance coverage. Um, so there's a lot of information on the state website, and email me if you have questions. And the nationwide ending of the pandemic emergency order meant that starting last month, everyone who is on Mass Health needs to renew their insurance coverage to make sure they still qualify without the expanded eligibility. So make sure you do that. Thanks. Thank you, Leela. Peter, is there anything you'd like to highlight? Mask oh. Mask mandate ends on May 11th. 11th. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> Go ahead, Peter. Is there anything you'd like to share? Uh, no, as Tessa said, the proposed school committee calendar uh, for next year is in your packet. Uh, you will notice that highlighted at the top is an option for a meeting start time based on what the committee wanted to do. Um, if you wanted to start at 6.30, I know a number of boards and committees um, in the community do start a little earlier, um, thinking people might be fresher with an earlier end time as well. Uh, but I also don't know what time, you know, people's schedules kick in from work and other obligations and things. But uh, we could think about shifting that. Uh, we also will have to um, pick a summer workshop date. Um, so, you know, that's also TBD as we get to the end of the year. And I think once we get our Boxborough members, um, then, you know, we'll send out a kind of doodle poll um, from our district office around, you know, possible summer workshop dates. We are hoping to do more of a full day workshop or an extended workshop this year just knowing that there's a lot of turnover um, but to really have time just to talk about how we want to all work together as a team uh, to move move work forward box pro town meeting is next Monday May 8th it is asked that if you are a member of the regional school committee that you attend even if you are not a resident of box pro so I look forward to seeing all of you there um, the next two school committee meetings are May 18th and June 8th here in the administration building at 7 p.m. Is there a motion to adjourn? Well, you got some Prior outside. to that, yeah. we do need to uh, thank Tessa for her service to our committee for the past six years. You know, Tessa, our kids shared a bus stop and a first day of school for more of the years than you and I have served on this committee. And while I know that we both have cringe-worthy first day of school pictures with our kids together, uh, we will hold those against them later. Um, you know, if I were to define your service on this committee for the past six years, I would say it's extraordinary. Um, not only did you succeed in your advocacy for more and better reading interventions, but you also served as our chair for two consecutive years and a day today. Um, those, those two consecutive years were through a pandemic uh, with significant community input on our work during that time. Uh, and so I think it's really important that we thank you for your dedication and service to the community. Thank you. With that, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Nope. All right. Have a good night.